Welcome everyone and thank you very much for attending a new Cytognos webinar. My name is Marta González from the Marketing Department and I'm very happy to introduce our guest, Evan Jensen, who will be speaking today about minimal residual disease in V acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Evan Jensen is the co-head of the Flow Cytometry Service at the National Children's Hospital in San Jose, Costa Rica, which is a national reference center. There, he carries out the immunophenotyping of hematological and immunological neoplasms in children and adults. He was trained in the cytometry service of uh, the University of Salamanca and the Portuguese Institute of Oncology. He is also a professor in the speciality of hematology at the University of Costa Rica. Evan is the founder and director of the Jensen Private Laboratory and he's also a certified cytometrist by the American Society of Clinical Pathology. Thank you very much, Evan, for sharing this time with us today. Hello, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here. First, I would like to thank Cytognos for this kind invitation, especially to Macarena Izquierda and Marta Gonzalez. I think that this webinar is a big opportunity to see the recent advance in flow cytometry, as well to know what are they doing in different countries. So I congratulate Cytognos for this initiative, and I hope to stay for a long time. The title of my presentation is 40 years of minimal residual disease. It will be a kind of review and we will focus in B acute lymphoblastic leukemia. But before I begin, I would like to introduce you my hospital. This is the National Children's Hospital in San Jose, Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a little country located in Central America. Our lab is located in this building. And for give you an idea, we recently acquired a second flow cytometry of 12 colors. So we now have a eight and 12 color flow cytometers. We function like a national reference center. So we also receive for diagnosis and MRD study adult samples. So we approximately process like 900 samples of MRD study. This includes not only the acute leukemia's MRD, but also for lymphomas and multiple myelomas. The overview of the key points of my presentation will be a little bit of history at the beginnings. What I think are the most important aspects to perform MR MRD by flow cytometry. We will, talk, we will talk about the next generation flow. We will see a practical case analysis. And the last one, it will be my concluding remarks. We know that biacular for last leukemia is immature B-cell precursors. A global incest is around one to five per 100 person a year. And the diagnosis is established by different techniques. Among them, is the immunophenotype the topic of us today? But what is minimal residual disease? How does this concept arise? Well, all the effort that we're making the diagnosis for the best classification and risk stratification of this disease is to provide the prognosis and to choose the best protocol for the patients. And we know that with the protocol uses today, we live in a high proportion of them to a complete remission. Although this complete remission concept is based on clinical and morphological criteria. And in hematological malignancies basis based in these morphological criteria, the cells, the malignant cells, must make up at least one to 5% of the leukocyte to be clinical or morphological detected. 
So it's clearly that basis in these uh, criteria, we have limited information of the effectiveness of the treatment because we are only going to recognize the patients, the patients with very poor prognosis. And we can not discriminate if we achieve a complete remission, the patients who have a low or high risk to relapse. So we need more sensitive techniques that can allow us to detect a small number of cells during or after the treatment. And that's what we call minimum residual disease detection. And the techniques, techniques that we have more sensitive today are molecular biology with PCR and GS and flow cytometry. So having now the concept, we're going to pass to the history. Here are some of the investigation of the first 20 years. We can see that um, all started in the early 80s in TLLL using CD3 and TDT in fluorescent microscopy. And for molecular biology, they also start early in the 80s using the stance repertory of the IGO or um, TG genes for studying small clonal um, cells to distinguish between normal and malignant B lymphocytes. The big jump for molecular biology was in the late 80s with the introduction of the PCR and for flow cytometry in the middle of the 90s, when they pass of using two markers to start implementing three to four color panels. So thanks to them and their investigation, we have the ba basic concepts and the knowledge to start implementing flow cytometry into the MRD studies. Concept that we are still using today and have divided this in three big areas, technical, immunophenotype, and clinical. In technical, we know that for, for process of a sample for MRD study, we need that it is to be fresh sample because apoptotic cells and diabetes can give us in a specific immunofluorescence. And if we are looking for a small number of cells, we can give false results. M of dilution. M of dilution is still now a very big obstacle. And here I recommend you that you have a very good relationship with your clinician to explain the, port, the importance of this um, problem. Because no matter your expertise, no matter your technique, your protocol, your cytometers, you have a memo dilution sample, you will never reach the sensitivity or a specificity that you need. I don't know how many of you remember the gating process when we have to acquire like a 50, 100, uh, thousand, sorry, number of cells and then do a second step for acquire like a 500 or 600 thousand of cells in the MRD uh, samples. We start talking to a level of sensitivity, at least one cells between 10,000 cells. From the immunophenotype, in the immunophenotype in the beginning with the first MRD studies, we use the basic concepts that was start looking for the empty spaces. So it's, it's fundamental that the professional is going to do an MRD study know the normal patterns 
of differentiation. So here we have the very useful markers that we know now as a backbone markers and are useful to, to study the different stage of the B-cell differentiation in bone marrow. Thanks to them and the knowledge in the normal patterns, we can recognize the leukemia associated monophenotypes. And this is basic for the person who are going to start performing an MRG study. We, we, have, we can divide it in four of them, a topic phenotype, a synchronous expression, over or ab absence of expression, and cross lineage. Another um, important issue to perform an MRD is the panel of diagnosis. If you have a, if you have a strongest or robust panel of diagnosis, you will have more information, and the markers will help you to have that fingerprint of the leukemic cell that we are looking for. So you will have more sensitivity. On the opposite side, if you have a modest panel, maybe you don't have, you will not reach the information needed. You, maybe you will not identify the cells amount of a lot of quantity of uh, regeneration cells. So the panel like diagnosis is very important. Here I show you some of the first panel proposing different big uh, center flow cytometry back the years. As you can see, it was a lot of work, like 12 um, tubes for MRD study or six tubes. So it was, it was very um, complicated to do an MRD study or, or, or take a lot, lot of time. In the clinical part, in the clinical part, if we, read, if we read the papers back then, we will always see the same symptoms. MRD is a promise, promising method. Okay, I will take you in consideration. It will help me to guide some decisions. Well, I know that the most attractive option is flow cytometry or PCR. The times to perform an MRD, it will be induction, consolidation, but if, if none of them use an MRD result to make a clinical decision. So this is history. Now we pass to the 21st century and everything changed. Since the first clinical trials, when it is proposed to stratify the patients, patients according to the MRD levels. This is an example of a Dutch protocol, one of the first ones to start using MRD as a criteria. As you can see here, they use two different time points, day 33 and day 78. If the patient still have an MRD positive result, uh, at day 78, it will be stratified into a high risk group and it will receive an intensification of the treatment. Instead, if you have a patient with a MRD negative results at both of the time points, it will be stratified in the standard group and will be benefit of a redu uh, reduction in the treatment. So, this change our way of decision making to modify the treatment into a second line, but not when the patient relapses, but to evaluate the treatment. So consequently, as you can see in many clinical trials in 21th century, the assessment of the early therapy response by measure MRD is the strongest pronostic factor for survival. And even in more recent uh, investigations, 
where it's actively intervened according to the MRD levels, especially into the high risk, high risk group, when it, there is an intensification of the treatment, you will see the improvement of the, of the intervention, like the improvement of the event-free survival, as you can see, there is an improvement. You will see the delay in the relapse, the decrease in the toxicity of the deaths, and the events of second malignancies. This is another sample of clinical investigation with flow cytometry, where you still have the power of the MRD result as can stratify the patient in different groups, no matter if they're adults or if they had a genetic feature of good or bad, or bad prognosis. MRD still can predict the outcome. So if you, if you want to understand the, the general consideration of MRD results, take, take this uh, as an example. MRD is a dependent time point variable. So you will have different information on time in the protocol. If you measure an MRD study at early time, you will recognize the early responders or you can predict the outcome. If you do it late in the treatment, you could stratify or recognize the patient with a high risk group to relapse. Additional, the pronostic significance of MRD can be influenced by second uh, with second elements of treatment. And finally, if you have a negative result, not necessarily indicate you that you have eradicated the disease. What really indicates you are below the limit the detection of your technique. But saying all of this, I think that we can reach the main goal of the MRD. And that is, that is, is proof or that is clinical useful. So we can say that there are four points of clinical utility of MRD to evaluate the, the quality of the, the complete response, to predict the patient outcome, but most import, important, it allows to stratify the risk of the relapse after the treatment to give a more personalized therapy to the patient according to the risk or to the new information after the treatment that he, he received. So I finish here the clinical part. What I think are the most important aspects to perform MRD by flow cytometry. I also divide it in the three areas, technical, phenotype, clinical, I just finally see. So technical, we'll speak about the source of material, book lysis, new cytometers, sensitivity, and lower limit of detection and quantification. Source of material. I know if I ask you now, which sample do you use for MRD study, you will say per, for, um, bone marrow. But take this into account. Bone marrow is an invasive procedure, not suitable for monitoring. You cannot give absolute counts. And like I said, you had the problem of the MO dilution Remember that for MRD, the first pool has have to go to an MRD study. And it's better if you don't receive a lot of a volume. You it's better when it's two to four or five milliliters maximum. It's instead for peripheral blood, the patient can go to the nearest clinical laboratory, take this, take the sample and send them to you. 
because it's a minimal invasive procedure that is suitable for monitoring. You can give absolute counts and re reflect more closely the dissemination of a tumor. But there are investigations like this comparing peripheral blood and bone marrow in an MRD study, as you can see for a TLL, you will have very concordant results. But for a P acute leukemia, you will always have more positive results for bone marrow than for, for peripheral blood. And also if you had positive results in peripheral blood in bone marrow, it's always 10 times more the detecting, detecting cells. So we, it's clearly that the best sample is bone marrow. But this investigation was made almost 20 years ago. We have an improvement in the sensitivity and the techniques. So this is a recent uh, work of the German group comparing the same thing. TLL, BLA, uh, bone marrow, and peripheral blood. As you can see for TLL, with the improvement of the techniques and sensitivity, the discrepancies are minimal. So they recommend peripheral blood or bone marrow to perform a MMRD study. For um, B acute leukemia, we still see they have, that we have more, more positive results in bone marrow, and is an important percentage. So we, we can say that peripheral blood is not this, that sensitive as, as bone marrow, but you have to take this into account. In the positive cases in bone marrow and peripheral blood, you can recognize a group, a group of patients that have more risk to, re to an early relapse. So peripheral blood is not as sensitive for the MMRD, but perform this study in conjunction with the, uh, uh, bone marrow, give you more information to recognize this um, especially group of patients. Another question that always do the clinician do it, we have to take a pair of samples from the left on the right on the bone marrow. This is be because uh, many years ago it has been speculated that the leukemia cells in acute leukemia have a homogeneous distribution, but with the treatment, this could change. And the tumor low can decrease in different bone marrow compartments. This may cause, may cause that during different bone marrow aspirate in the follow-up, you have different levels of MRD. But there are investigations that they prove there are no signs of unequal distribution of the leukemic cells in the bone marrow. So if you have a good sample, it will represent very good what is going on in that uh, patient. Bull lysis. Bull lysis is a protocol that, that takes us one step forward into a new level of science sensitivity. Because let us do you process microliters to start using milliliters. If this protocol is valid for bone marrow and peripheral blood, you have to access the cell concentration before any manipulation because the main objective is to have at least 10 million cells and to acquire in each tube of the MRD sample five or more million of nucleated cells. This is an overview of the protocol. This will increase you like in 40 or 50 minutes, your usual process of MRD study. New, new, new cytometers. With new cytometers, 
They bring us new fluorescence, new combinations. We can use new markers. So we, we get more information. Another advantage is in technology. We can use the acoustic focusing that use ultrasonic um, ways to push the particle to the center of the stream. And additionally, with the hydrodynamic pressure, these two forces create a very narrow core stream that can increase the frequently that the path cell one by one into the optical system. Another advantage is the we, we get with the a protocol of, of book lysis and new cytometry, new level of sensitivity. And like I said, only if we process the enough number of cells. This is fundamental. We start acquiring three, four, or five million cells per tube to reach that kind of sensitivity. And if we reach that kind of sensitivity, we can now compare with PCR. And if we use a cutoff point like 0 0.01, we have a level of concordance of almost 96%. With new cytometers, like I said, we won in sensitivity and we also won in specificity. In this uh, figure, uh, they compare four color flow cytometry, cis color, and PCR. The levels of, of kudos points are revealed here in different colors. As, as you can see in day 15, we have very similar results. And you know that in, in day 15, you always have a very representative or high number of, of leukemic cells. So it's very easy to distinguish the blast for the normal counterpart. But what happened in the day 78? As you can see here, it appears that um, four chlorofluorous atometry are detecting more positive uh, cases than six color of PCR. But what is really happened here is that we have we we have false positives because you know that at day seventy eight we have a lot of regeneration in the bone marrow we had a lot of hematogons so with uh, less markers we have less information and maybe we can we are confusing and give you a false positive result so. We new improvement on cytometry fluorescence and sensitivity, we are reducing the false positive. And we are reaching the level of the PCR. Another consideration very important is when you do the report and is related to the sensitivity of, of an MRD study to, to perform or to use your uh, establish your limit of detection and quantification. I just give you two examples. Imagine that you have a result of 0.003% of blast. As you can see, you have a higher number of the limit of detection and quantification. So it's clearly a positive result. But what happened if you detect 0.0005% of blast? You have a percentage that is below the limit of quantification, but above of the limit of detection. So what is recommended that you describe the number of blasts that you are seeing, seeing and make a, uh, like a um, relate that you say, that, well, I have a percentage of blood is below the limit of quantification, but it's above the detection limit. Is still a positive result, and is a monitoring is recommended. 
We are now in the immune phenotype part. We will discuss the chief in phenotypes, some of the best marker to perform a BMRD analysis, the new panels that we can create now with the new fluorescence, the most important thing in every MRD result has to be reproducible between labs and different ways to make an analysis using a software. It is proven that during the treatment, phenotypic change can take place. This phenomenon usually affects what we call the backbone markers. And this creates a problem if we use the classical strategies to perform an MRD analysis. This change can be caused by a presence of leukemic subclones that harbor a different antigenic profile, already a diagnosis, but, but they are more resistant during the first period of treatment than the bulk of the leukemic cells. Another reason could be by drug induced, especially esteroids and induction and can modulate genetic expression. And the last one is a technical issue like apoptosis, or, and this is important, if you constantly change the fluorochromes or the clones of your CD markers, you, have, you will have different levels of expression, no matter if you're using the same antibody. For all these reasons, I suppose it is demonstrated that this phenomenon is mostly caused by a drug induced. And some of the markers more frequently affected are CD10 and CD34. You can see a down regulation of its expression. This modulation of expression is more pronounced immediately after induction and subsequent reverse in the later time of treatment. It has absolutely been observed that these therapy-induced change are independent of the MRD status or other risk factor. This is an example, a diagnosis, the blast present CD34 and CD10, at day 33 in an MRD study, you will see taking the reference image, a diagnosis, how the blast have a down regulation of CD10 and almost a negative for CD34. At day 52, they appear to still winning. Again, the what you can say, the normal expression that usually have a diagnosis. So here the question, what is the best selection of markers to perform a BMRD analysis? Because if you have the best selection, you will be able to see this phenotypic change, but also to recognize the presence of leukemic cells. So to perform or uh, to choose the markers, we no doubt we have to take into account the backbone markers. These antibodies that we know them for so many years ago are the base to establish the different stage of maturation of B cells. But we have difficulties when we perform an MRD analysis with a lot of regeneration. So there is a need for more markers that would help us to distinguish between malignant and normal cells. We need to improve our sensitivity. So what should have this marker to take in a combination of BMRD study? Well, they had to be stable during treatment and have a deviation from normal B-cell precursors. One of them could be CD73. We usually relate it with mesenchymal cells, but it's also expressed on B lymphoblast and in the normal counterpart, we restricted to the most mature B cell compartment. 
is a marker, most commonly positive in MRD samples, with a stability of 95%, have the highest frequency of retention and gain. And by this, I mean, as you can see here, diagnostic and MRD, CV73 is frequently expressed, almost 77% of, of cases. But in the MRD samples, you will see an increase of the percentage. So the blast can warn the expression of this mark. And for the retention, as you can see during here treatment and induction, the blast of the MRD sample still had the positivity for this marker. And even if you compare to the diagnostics, so the diagnostic have a higher level of respiration. So these two characteristics make CD73 a powerful marker for AMRD study. Here is an is a example of how you will see the level of respiration of CD73. This is a, the VCP uh, compartment, the VCP2, the V-cell precursor one and two, the transactional immature, the most mature B-cells who express CD73. If we use a control like T and indical cells, you will see the minimal level of expression of BCP precursors compared with the big difference of leukemic B-cells or mature ones. We also can use the APS view. And if we use this combination of marker, we can see how good it is, how strong it is to recognize between mm, normal B cells from leukemic cells. If, if we extract or we take out the, the information that CD73 give us, as you can see, we, it is almost impossible in some cases to distinguish between normal precursors from leukemic cells. Another marker could be CD66. This is a myelin marker. Have a, one of the best characteristics because it's not expressed in B cell, in all the B cell differentiation, but only in the leukemic cells. CD81 is a tetraspanning molecule. And here is the down regulation of this expression that help us to recognize between B cell precursors for leukemic cells. And you can see here very clearly, this is the normal CD34 hematogons compared with CD34 blast. Another CD304, it is present normally in dendritic cells, but it is also in lymphoblast, B lymphoblast. Have association with the presence of translocation 1221 and have a little disadvantage of a decreased expression during treatment. But despite this, it seems that almost more than half of the cases still remain a positivity for this marker. So you may consider this a, a good marker for BMRD study. So now that we talk about the marker, now we are going to create the new panels. But to talk about new panels, reproducibility and software, we have to talk about Aeroflow. Aeroflow is a European consortium that have standardized the clinical flow cytometry in different kinds of levels. This is the first algo algorithm of work, is divided in two parts, and all is based to answer a clinical question. And with this combination marker that we call the screening tubes, give us the information to perform a complete um, panel of diagnosis. This is the panel for BCP ALL acute leukemia. As you can see, we have to use the backbone markers. We also have markers associated with molecular alterations. Use, we have markers for establish the stage of maturation also marker related to follow-up. As they have 
establish or standardize a diagnosis panel, they also have created with and standardized a panel for BMRD studies. The markers that do you see here, their selection are, are based on their power to distinguish between a normal B cell precursors from A, B, C, P, acute leukemia cells. So with this combination, you have a sensitive, quantifiable, standardized, and reproducible results. And the strongest, the strongest of these combinations comes together. Because if you perform both of the tubes, you will have or you be able in the 90% of the cases to distinguish between a malignant B cell from normal B cells. So may, you may think now that if you have this panel, you will have all. But forgive the best result of MRD, it all starts in the sample. It has to be the first pool without M dilution, and then you have to implement a protocol that allow you to process four or more million of cells for each of the tube. And then you perform this combinational marker, you will reach a new kind of sensitivity comparable to molecular techniques. If you complete all these steps, you are now in the next generation flow cytometry. And to prove that your results are reproducible, but you had to follow some protocols and encourage you to participate in quality programs. This is our third year participating in the minimum resilient program of Euroflow and almost five or six years of the lymphoid screening tube. This is the only way that you can be sure that your result is reproducible and you can send your files to another center and be analyzed, analyzed by the same way. The software. The software we use here is the Infinisite. I think we have three different ways to make analysis, the classical moderation pathway and use database. The classical way, and I, I'm honest, this is still the, the form that I use every day, using a PAN B cell marker like CD19, you select all the base cells, redefine your, your selection by forward scatter, CD45, and then start looking for the normal pattern of differentiation and leukemia-associated phenotypes with the combination of aeroflow. It's very easy to find the, these malignant cells. And you will see in the APS view, always is going to discriminate between normal population for malignant cells. The maturation tool, this tool was created, I think most for the mild disparity syndrome, but we can use it for a study or academic um, issues to, to understand the different level of expression of the B-cell uh, maturation. For example, you can create your own database for, from your B cell differentiation using normal bone marrows. Then you can, you can select or identify the different stage of maturation of the B cell um, differentiation. And you will see in the diagram of maturation pathway, what is the normal level of expression of each of the markers? Then when you create the library, you can compare with a case. In the gray zone is the reference normal range of the markers. If we see outside the gray zone, it will be the abnormal level of expression of the different markers. For this example, 
the green dots are the mature ones, as you can see, have almost the same level of expression that they reference. But these immature cells have a overexpression CD19, lower expression CD10, CD38, CD81. So it's clearly aberrant cells. Now we can additional put a, like a CD66 and see that there is a positivity. So it's clearly that it not, there is not a um, BC, BCP precursor, they are blast. The last one is a database that is still not available in the program, it's coming soon. I'm not going to speak in detail about this uh, tool because already Elaine in her excellent presentation explaining to us, but it consists in compare your file with a big Euroflow database. They will cluster your different population of your case and make an automatic uh, analysis. And in the final, you will be able to supervise that analysis. So I think this is the next step for MRD reports and results. And remember that we always need us to supervise that analysis. So I think this is the most important aspect to perform MRD, MRD studies. The future comes with increasing the combination markers, but these new additional markers, I think they have to be with the information of the new therapies. For example, blinatumumab and CAR T cells. So if we have a standardized combination and, have, and we have therapies like this, I think the most convenient is to include markers like CD19 that are pan-B cell markers to avoid the problem if the cells are absent of the, of the CD19. Another well is to the CD markers are CD88 and CD44 that are very stable and have a deviation from normal and can be a suggestion for establish new combination of markers. So finally, we pass to the practical case. This is a, a adult, a female adult of 40, 42 years old. We know previous history of diseases. She presents to the emergency room for abdominal pain. They perform a blood count. And as you can see, she have a pancytopenia. They only prescribe and antibiotics and painkillers. And she was translated to the hematology unit where they decided to perform a bone marrow. The sample was sent to our service and we found 24% of blasts with a phenotype compatible with a common b leukemia. We send the result and immediately we have a call from the clinician where we check for the report because in morphology, the most important aspect that they are seeing is these, these FOMI cells. So I decided to wait and start looking for a non hematolic malignancies. They send us sample two days after the first study, and to complicate more the case, we only find we only find five percent of blast, and the blood count almost normalized with a leukocyte now very in normal range, and the platelets improve almost to normal levels. So here we have several questions. Are really a leukemic blast or hematogons? Can we have here a modulation problem? Could be the patient self-medicated? Or could we have a spontaneous remission of 
acute leukemia. For the first point, we are clearly by immunophenotype. These are blasts. There are no hematograms. The M evolution, well, the sample was taken by the same clinician with more than 20 years of experience. The sample came less than 24 hours to our lab and with no signs of, of this deterioration. So we rule out this, this option. The patient was interrogated and she denied, she strongly denied the use of a different drugs uh, that she was prescribed. So we have these other options and these cases are very a few in the literature, only six cases. This is a rare phenomenon. This is associated with fever on, um, on sexes. It is suggested that the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and immune cells during a severe infection can balance the pro-leukemic towards an anti-leukemic environment and induce a temporary remission of acute leukemia and suppression of hematopoiesis. The phenomenon is temporary and the prognosis of patients is identical of a classical acute leukemia case. So with this finding, they decided to wait. We also asked for another sample another day. So he sent us another at day five after the first study. And we find 11% we find of blast. But we have here an additional information for molecular biology. The patients have a positive for trial location 922. So we clearly have blast here. They still decided to, to wait. And we perform a day 12 from the initial study and we find 21% of blast. They here start the therapy and we receive a day 33, an MRD study that we still find blast of a level of 0.03% of blast. And one month ago, we received a uh, four day 72, an MRD study, we didn't find any blast. It was a MRD negative for the immunophenotype and also for molecular biology. So this case was very interesting for us for the initial presentation and the change in the percent of blast. So the hypothesis could be a spontaneous remission, or we cannot rule out uh, the patient will set medicate. So finally, my conclusion remarks are, we now know how and when we can perform an MRD study. For monitoring in malignant disease, hematological. Morphological criteria still remains, but are progressively being replaced with more sensitive techniques. MRD status in some protocols is now taken into account to make treatment decisions. The bone marrow is the sample of selection for MRD study B acute leukemia, but the peripheral blood can give you additional information for patients with high risk of relapse. Next generation flow, not only consists in a combination of markers, is a, it consists in a group of different protocols for be able to get a next generation flow results. An automatic analysis is the next step is coming soon and will help us to uniform our results. This is our group. This is a photo of 2019. And I 
I'm not in the photo. I was on vacations with my friend, through loops. I just want to show you here on this wall, as you can see, there are different mark of hands. These are the patients that have finished their treatment and free of disease. And they leave her mark in the hospital. They also Pulver had this, this bell. It's a very sentimental moment, especially obviously for the family, but all the hematology oncology group have a reunion there. Because at, at last the, the mangle of of our profession is to contribute to the health of the patients. So here I finish. I open to your question. But before that, I just would like to make an invitation. If you are tired to be at home and you want to be in touch with the nature, to come to the essential, come to Costa Rica. Do you now have a contact here? You can write me for flow cytometry or for an advice to when, how, and where to visit Costa Rica. So thank you very much for your attention and I welcome to your question.